Well, good morning, church. I want to thank you so much for joining us this morning as we worship the Lord and open up the Word of God together. It's my prayer that the Holy Spirit would uh, be guiding us into all truth again as we open up the Word of God together. So if you have your Bibles, which I hope that you do, I'm going to ask that you grab those and you open them to Malachi chapter 1. Today, it is my hope to look at verses 1 through 5. So after a year and a half, over a year and a half actually, in the Gospel of Matthew, today we're moving along to a new book of the Bible. Uh, I believe that you probably uh, have heard this before, but I, uh, I, I believe that it's best for us to be working consistently through books of the Bible. There's certainly room for us to do a topical series from time to time. This last Christmas, we took five weeks and uh, we're reminded what Christmas is all about. Uh, a few years back, we took a few weeks and looked at the five solas of the Reformation, uh, but these topical series uh, are uh, really the exception. The the norm for us is that we're going to be working through books of the Bible. And my goal as we do this is to exposit the word of God. And again, I think the best way for us to do that is in context. So again, uh, normally what we're doing is we're working through books of the Bible from start to finish. And that's why today we are heading to the last writing prophet of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. Now, if you are, uh, if you're still kind of searching in your Bibles for the book of Malachi, because it's a small one, only four chapters. Uh, If you're still searching around for it, or maybe you're at the table of contents, I want to to bring you a little encouragement here. You don't need to search too much. Uh, We've spent about a year and a half in the Gospel of Matthew, which is the first book of the New Testament. Uh, Today, we're going to be in the book of Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament. So all you have to do is turn back one book from the Gospel of Matthew, and you will be at uh, the book of Malachi. Now today what I'd like to do uh, is really just dive into the first five uh, five verses of this of this book, the book of Malachi. And as we prepare to do that, I think it would be good for us to have a little bit of information about Malachi. Now, obviously, uh, Malachi is, is the author of this book, and you can see that right there in verse 1. If you glance down at it, you'll see uh, that this is written by the hand of, of Malachi. And uh, as I studied a little bit this week and read different commentaries, what I found out is really not much about Malachi, because we don't know a lot about him. Uh, his name means my messenger, and again, he's one of the, or he is the last writing prophet. Uh, the book of Malachi is one of the 12 minor prophets. I mentioned it just a minute ago. It's only four chapters long. Most scholars date the book of Malachi to be written around 450 to 430 BC. It's after Israel's return from exile. It's, it's very probable that Malachi was a contemporary of Nehemiah. If you remember quite a while back, we actually worked through the book of Nehemiah. And, we, and if you remember that, you remember that Ezra and Nehemiah were the ones... <clears throat> that led the exiled Jews back into their land. After 70 years of exile in Babylon, uh, they were, uh, they were uh, the ones who led the people back into Jerusalem. So Ezra is the one who reestablished temple life. Nehemiah is the one who, uh, who secured Jerusalem's walls. So both Ezra and Nehemiah, what they were concerned about were, was, was right worship, like making sure that the people were uh, getting back to worshiping God as the one true God. So the issues that Malachi deals with are very similar to the issues that Nehemiah deals with. And that's why we say that it's probable that Malachi was a contemporary of Nehemiah. So in in Nehemiah chapter 13, you don't need to turn there, but in Nehemiah 13 verses 6 and 7, we find that uh, at at the end of the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah was out of town. He was out of Jerusalem for a while. He was back serving the king. And while he was away, uh, the people uh, begin to really just fall apart spiritually. So everything that Ezra and Nehemiah were trying to do with the people to get them to b- be worshiping the Lord rightly once again, all of that started to fall apart. So uh, the, the priests became uh, corrupt. Uh, their worship of God became corrupt. 
Their relationships became corrupt. Uh, and it, it's possible, it's very possible, in fact, this is where I would lean this morning, it's very possible that Malachi is actually the prophet that is called to go out and expose the sins of the people during the days of Nehemiah. So the bottom line, so uh, I know that's not a lot of information, it's some, uh, the bottom line this morning is that, that, is that in Malachi, the people of God need to hear the the word of God. So that's really the bottom line here in this last book of the Old Testament. The people of God need to hear the word of God. They have become corrupt once again. They have forgotten their God. Their, their worship isn't genuine and they need to hear the word of the Lord. They need to be prepared for the coming of the Messiah, which many of you know is only going to be 400 years after uh, this book is, is, uh, is written. So they need to be prepared. They need to be evaluated waiting their hearts. They need to make sure that their worship isn't corrupt and that they are ready for the coming, the first, uh, the first advent, the first coming of Jesus in human flesh. And so today as we approach the book of Malachi, I think it's good for us to ask these kinds of questions about ourselves. Maybe we've forgotten God to a certain degree. Maybe we have fallen into corruption. Maybe our worship has, has not been genuine. Just like the people of Malachi's day uh, here need to evaluate their hearts, I think it's good for us always to be evaluating our hearts as well, uh, to be sure that our hearts are right with the Lord, that we are humble and that we are contrite and that we are trembling at his word. So here in the book of Malachi, we're going to be reminded over the next several weeks, we're going to be reminded of God's holy character. And as we're reminded of God's holy character, we're going to be lovingly corrected where we have strayed. And so the main point uh, this morning for our sermon here today, as we look at these first five verses here in the book of Malachi, the main point is this, the correction of God flows from the love of God, which we can be sure of. I'll say that one more time. The correction of God flows from the love of God, which we can be sure of. So let's dive in here uh, to the first five verses of the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter 1, 1 to 5. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may rebuild, but I will tear down. And they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel." Will you bow with me in a word of prayer this morning as we prepare to work through these first five verses in Malachi? Father, we thank you so much this morning for your goodness towards us in Jesus. God, we thank you for the good news that Jesus came into this world, lived a perfect life, suffered and died in our place that we might be reconciled to you through faith. Father, we pray this morning that as we begin a new book of the Bible, the book of Malachi, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be the one who is guiding us into all truth. Lord, there, there are areas where we need to be encouraged today, and there are areas where we, where we need to be convicted. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd give us ears to hear the word of the Lord. God, I pray for my own mouth. God, I pray that I would get out of the way, and, and Lord, that, that your word would take center stage. So, Lord, we ask that you'd speak to us. Speak to us not only today, but speak to us as we work through this book of Malachi. God, we pray that you might be glorified as we do this. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now, the first thing that I want to do this morning as we are approaching these first five verses here in the book of Malachi is I want us to be reminded that what we have in front of us is the word of God declared. So what we're being reminded of here is the importance of the word of God. Now, again, as we begin uh, to think about the, the book of Malachi, I think it's important that we just don't skip over the first verse, uh, the first verse here in chapter one. So most of your Bibles probably read like mine. Here's what verse one says. 
the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. But, but church, you need to know that if you had the Hebrew in front of you and you knew Hebrew, you'd notice in comparison, uh, in comparing the Hebrew with the English text, you'd notice that there's a word missing. There's something that's missing here. The Hebrew actually reads like this. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by the hand of Malachi. By the hand of Malachi. Now, I'm not sure why, that, why that's not in our English translations, but by the hand of is there in the Hebrew. So this phrase, by the hand of, was a Hebrew idiom that was recognizable by the audience of Malachi. Essentially, what Malachi is doing as he says that this oracle of the word of the Lord is brought to you by the hand of Malachi, what he's saying uh, to the people who are going to read this is that this work, uh, as Malachi is putting uh, you know, ink to paper, this is not Malachi who is writing. This is not uh, Malachi's thoughts or Malachi's opinion. This is God's word. Malachi is claiming, and he wants to make it very clear here, this is divine inspiration uh, being written down. Now, again, this is important for us not to overlook, even though we've heard it before. What we have here in front of us today is the word of the living God. Not only in this short book of Malachi, but in all 66 books, Old Testament and New Testament of the Bible that we hold in our hand today, it is the word of God. And because God is perfect, in him there is no darkness, we know that his word is absolutely perfect. God does not lie. He cannot lie. In the word of God, there is no deceit. In the word of God, there is no falsehood. In the word of God, there is no manipulation. God's word is not only without error, we call that being infallible, God's word is incapable of having error because it's written by God. We call that being inerrant. The word of God is infallible. The word of God is inerrant. God's word is not, uh, is not like all the, maybe the fake news that you hear today. God's word is the only news that's perfectly true. It's the only solid place for us to stand. Uh, many of us know this scripture well, but in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 6, 16 and 17, we, we actually find the perfection of the word of God and the purpose of the word of God made clear. Uh, this is what it says, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, you'll notice there in that familiar text, uh, the words of scripture are are coming directly from God himself. So the word of God is breathed out by God. It's not just like inspired like in in a motivational way by God. It's it's coming directly from God. It's breathed out by him. And the reason for the word of God is to benefit the one who reads it and trusts in it. Uh, The Bible says here in 2 Timothy Timothy 3, 16 and 17 that the word is profitable to us. So it's good for us because because it teaches us, it brings reproof, it corrects us, and it trains us. The word of God, according to Hebrews 4.12, is, is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The word of God should go forth, and it should do something on the inside of us. It should reveal the intentions of our heart. It should correct us when we're wrong. It should train us in righteousness. The goal is that we would, as we read the word and we trust the word, is that we would grow in Christ's likeness and be equipped to obey the Lord. So the obvious conclusion, as we think about Malachi's claim here, that that this book, this work that he's written down is the word of God, the, the obvious conclusion is that you and I should listen up. Like our ears should perk up when we hear this is the oracle of the word of the Lord by the hand of Malachi. We should listen up and we should listen up because this is the creator of the cosmos who is speaking to us. It would be very unwise and very disastrous for you and I to turn to the book of Malachi and say, well, this is an important, uh, I'm just going to kind of skip on over this. It'd be very foolish for you and I to not listen when the creator of 
of the universe, the creator of every particle, uh, of every blade of grass, the creator of you and I, the creator of every mountain, the creator of it all. When he's speaking, if we don't listen, that is foolish. And yet, sadly, this is what so many do. So many people just kind of want to ignore the word of God or skip over it because so often the word of God can kind of rub us the wrong way. And we know that it's not just those out there, those outside the four walls of the church who struggle with the word of God. We know that too often it's us in here. It's us in here. It's people in the church who will skip over those hard texts or say, you know what? I just choose not to think about those things. I only want to think about these things that make me feel fuzzy and happy and good inside. You see, in the church, there is way too much eisegesis. And I think we're all guilty of it to a certain degree. There's way too much eisegesis, not enough exegesis. Eisegesis is when, is when we are reading the word of God and we are reading into the text of the word, our personal bias. In other words, we're making it say what we want it to say. We come across something that's difficult, and rather than looking for the intended meaning from God himself, we say, well, you know, that makes me uncomfortable, so I'm going to read in my bias. I'm going to make it say what I want it to say so that I feel better. We have way too much of that happening. Now, again, I understand that this question that we often ask is oftentimes well-intentioned. We approach the text and we say, well, what is this mean to you? I I understand that that oftentimes it's well-intentioned. We're just trying to start some discussion, but that's not the question we should be asking. We shouldn't ask, what does this mean to you? We should say, what did God intend when he wrote this down? When, When God had a human author, again, put ink to paper to write the very words of God, what was God intending to mean? What did God want us to know? That's the question we have to ask. And so there's too much eisegesis happening. We need more exegesis. We need to be those who are desiring uh, the the truth from the text to pull out the meaning, understanding that there is truth here to be had. We want the truth. Now, again, I'm not trying to get crazy legalistic here. None of us are going to be perfect in that. None of us are going to have absolutely 100% perfect theology because because, uh, we have human brains, right? And and we struggle with sin and we do, uh, uh, do eisegesis sometimes. So none of us are going to have it perfectly, but church, all I'm trying to say is that this should be the aim. God, what did you intend as, as, as you put the book of Malachi together? You see, when we read our bias into a text, I think it's really because what we're trying to do is avoid, avoid the difficulty that comes as we read those hard, difficult texts. And we make the Bible say what we want it to say because then we don't have to do the hard work of evaluating our hearts. You see, allowing the word of the living God that's sharper than any two-edged sword, allowing the word to operate on our hearts is going to hurt. It's going to hurt, and it's going to be uncomfortable, but it's best. It's best for us. It reminds me of th- this past week. One of my, one of my little boys, I have three boys, and, and one of the boys, Drew, was outside playing, and uh, he's doing something. I'm not sure what he was up to, uh, but he got a, a pretty deep sliver. So he got a sliver, and I, I think that he would have been content, although it hurt a little bit and it was uncomfortable, I think he would have been content just kind of like not letting anybody know about it because he knew that once his dad saw that there was a big sliver in his finger, that we were going to have to get that thing out of there. And so, uh, and so he came in the house. Uh, it was revealed to me that he had the sliver, and I had to sit him down, and I had to say, listen, that sliver is not good for you. Like, that's, that's going to create an infection. It's going to create more pain down the road. You might be able to get by with it right now, but give it a couple days, and that's not going to be doing well. And so, Drew, we need to get that sliver out. And so I sat him down, and it was painful. I mean, he's four years old. He was crying because we had to do a little bit of digging to get this thing out. So we, we, we dug a little bit. We got that sliver out and it was good for him. There was relief to get this foreign object out of uh, underneath his skin. And so this is what the word of God is to do, dear church. The word of God will, will hurt a little bit. It, it's uncomfortable. It can be hard, uh, but it's necessary. It's good for us. It's the only thing that will bring healing to us. Now, now church, there's another point 
Another important detail, I should say, to point out here in verse 1. You'll notice that Malachi says that this is the oracle of the word of the Lord. Uh, The word oracle actually means burden. So as Malachi begins to pen this work, he's literally calling the words he's about to write down a burden or like a load. Malachi is saying that he is burdened to share the word of the Lord with the people. He's made it clear again that this word is not his word. So he's saying, look, don't shoot the messenger here. This is God's word. I'm just writing it down. But now he's saying that that this word that has been given to me, uh, I must tell you it. Like I I have to tell you it. I'm burdened. There's a weight on my back. I'm going to tell you it even if it hurts. And you know what? It's going to hurt a little bit because the message is repent or be destroyed. You're in sin and you need to repent or you will be destroyed. God's people have strayed. And like a faithful husband, God is, is drawing them back. He's calling them back unto himself. And now he's burdened Malachi to write this down for the benefit of the people. So what God is about to do in the book of Malachi is he is about to bring correction to his people. He's going to bring some correction uh, and and even maybe some training here because what the word of God does, he's going to bring this so that they will respond. But I want us to notice today that God doesn't come on in and just start cracking the whip, right? He doesn't just begin with the correction. No, God in the book of Malachi begins with love. So although the people doubt God's love, God God clearly declares his love. Look at verse 2, and this is our next point. God declares his love. Verse 2, I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob. So before God declares any correction here, he he clearly declares to his people his sovereign love. The the text reads, I have loved you. I read another translation this week that says, uh, that, that says, I have always loved you. And I really liked that, that translation. Uh, as I read that this week, it just reminded me of just the relentless, a strong, powerful love of God. This is not just God saying to his people, you know, hey, I kind of sort of think I love you or something. It's not, this isn't a junior high or high school love, but rather this is God saying to his people, I love you even when you don't think that I love you. I love you even when you don't feel uh, love on the inside. I love you even when you don't deserve my love. I love you even when you don't see it. I love you even when you forget it. Church, God's love does not fluctuate. God is not like you and I. That's the mistake that we often make. We think God is like us. God is God. We are humans. And God does not fluctuate. He is love. When he says he loves, he absolutely means it. This is how God's love is portrayed uh, throughout the entire Bible. What we're seeing here in Malachi is consistent with who God is. God always is declaring love before law. It's grace before law. And this is what's happening here in the book of Malachi. God is declaring love before he brings correction. But I think of other examples as well. And the most prominent example that I can think of is is the Exodus. Right? You think about the Exodus and, and, and I don't we don't have the time to go into it too deeply. You know the story. God's people have been enslaved in Egypt for hundreds of years, and they're crying out for mercy. And God, as he raises up Moses, miraculously delivers them from, from, from slavery in Egypt. And what we need to recognize here is that God worked on their behalf to demonstrate his love. He graciously worked on their behalf before the law came. Right? This is before the Ten Commandments. This is before Mount Sinai. This is before the law. And so God shows his people, you know, fire by day or, or fire by night, cloud by day, splitting of the Red Sea, manna in the desert, all this stuff. It's before the law. And so God comes in and he brings grace. He declares love before the law. 
So again, before God brings rebuke, and this is here in Malachi, he declares his love. But even still, the people in Malachi are doubting God's love. You'll see that in the middle part of verse 2. They, they respond, or, and God's reading their thoughts, really, and they're saying, how have you loved us? Like, how, how have you loved us? Well, we're doubting it. See, for the people of Malachi's day, it's probable that things weren't going like maybe they had envisioned things to go. In their minds, maybe God had failed to fulfill his promises. Things weren't turning out the way that they had hoped that things would turn out for the nation of Israel. And I think this is maybe a place where we can all relate a little bit. I, I, I think that we can all say that at certain times in our lives, we've doubted the love of God. If, if you were here at church today, I'd ask you to raise your hand. How many of us have doubted the love of God? And I think all your hands would go up and say, yeah, there have been times where I've doubted whether or not God really does love me. And maybe for you, it's because life just didn't turn out the way that you expected. You're in your late teens, you had, you had a vision for life, you had goals, you thought things were going to turn out a certain way, and it just hasn't happened that way. And so you feel like, you know what, God, are you there? God, do you love me? Maybe, maybe it is a feeling thing with you. Your, 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 your feelings have lied to you and you don't feel love, so you begin to doubt his love. Maybe like David in Psalm 13, your cry is often, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? See, dear church, maybe, maybe this very day, this very day, God has us in the book of Malachi and he has you listening to this sermon because he wants you to know today. He wants you to be reminded that he loves you. I mean, maybe this is, none of this is an accident. God wants you to know he loves you. You see, I think, I think one of the number one lies of the enemy and, and one of these whispers that comes into our ear is that you know, God doesn't love you. God doesn't care. And this is the same lie of the garden. And we know this is true. Right? In, the, in the garden of Eden, God has given Adam and Eve this one command, not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat of that tree. And, and it's, it's a good command because God is good and he loves Adam and he loves Eve. But the serpent comes in and he whispers in Eve's ear. God tell, told you not to eat of that tree because he doesn't love you. He doesn't care for you. See, this is the whisper. This was the whisper to Abraham. God made a promise to Abraham and his wife, Sarah, even though you've been barren, you're going to have a son uh, and that son would be Isaac. You're going to have a son and you're just going to have to trust me. And so Abraham's waiting and waiting and waiting for an heir and it's not happening. And so he listens to his wife because he hears the whisper and she hears the whisper, God's forgotten you. God's forgotten the promise. You're going to have to take things into your own hands. And so he is with Hagar and he has Ishmael. He heard the whisper. This was the lie to Peter. Peter, I mean, Peter, very bold, but also fails miserably from time to time. Just kind of like you and I. And Peter denies his Lord three times. He, he abandons, uh, uh, abandons Jesus uh, in, his, in his time of greatest need. And Jesus has risen from the grave. And I think it just appears to me when you read the gospel accounts, especially in the book of John, I think it is, right? Peter is probably feeling as though he's, he's sinned too much. Like they're, they're, they're God can't use him anymore. I think he maybe heard the whisper of the evil one. God doesn't love you anymore. You, you've sinned so much. You've denied your Lord. Go back and start fishing because God has no purpose for you. You see, here in our text, God not only, not only says that he loves his people, but he is reminding his people. He's saying, I love you, and hey, listen up. I want you to remember how I've loved you. Now, the key word or the key idea for us in, in God's reminder to his people is the word sovereign. I know it's not here in the text, the word sovereign, but, but it's, it's definitely there when you read verses one through five. You see, God is telling his people, I love you, and I want you to remember I've chosen to love you. So the example God gives has to do with Jacob and Esau. We know that Abraham and Sarah had Isaac. Isaac married Rebekah, and Rebekah was pregnant with twins, uh, Jacob and Esau. 
Esau. Now Esau, culturally, because he was the firstborn, he was the one who should have had the blessing. But God is saying, he's confirming his love to his people by reminding them, I chose Jacob, I didn't choose Esau. God loved Jacob and chose his line for the nation of Israel, not the line of Esau. This was God's free choosing, and it had nothing to do with culture, had nothing to do with birth order, had nothing to do with works, because neither of the twins had an opportunity to do anything or bad. God is reminding the people of Malachi's day, who are descended from the line of Jacob, he's saying, I chose you when Jacob was in the womb. I chose Jacob. I set my love on him. I chose to establish covenant there, not with Esau. I want you to remember that I love you. I, I, I love how Paul, uh, Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 9. He looks back on this very event. And in Romans chapter 9, verses 10 and 12, listen to what Paul says under the inspiration of the Spirit. It says, and not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. And then I, I, I think verse 16 really, really summarizes the point here. It says, so then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. You see, God here is reminding his people, I chose to be merciful to you. I chose, I freely chose to love you. Now, again, I understand here because we've talked about these things enough here at church. I understand what happens when these sort of ideas get brought up, when we start talking like this and we say, well, you know, God chose Jacob, not Esau before they were born and all that kind of stuff. What happens is we begin to get uncomfortable. These are the places where we can start to say, you know what? I don't like this, and so I'm just going to skip over it and pretend it's not there. We start to struggle, and we start to ask questions, and we go, what's going on here? That seems not fair. It doesn't make any sense. Why was why Jacob, and why not Esau? This just, I don't understand this at all, and what we need to realize here today is that God is reminding his people that he chose Jacob not to make them struggle. Like, God is not saying, you know what? I know how to really throw them a curveball. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell them I chose them. And then they're going to be all confused and frustrated. That's not what's happening. God is actually comforting his people. He's saying, listen, I am declaring my love. And now let me remind you of my love. I chose you. This is meant to comfort the people of God. God is reassuring his people of his love by way of reminder. He's saying, I have always loved you. And it's not because of your works. It's not because of these things that you did. It's not because you pulled yourself up by your bootstraps, but rather it's because of my free choosing to establish covenant with you. It's on you that I have set my love. Now, church, as this section moves on, God goes on to make a contrast to continue to prove his love to his people. And the contrast has to do with the descendants of Esau, who, which were the Edomites, and the descendants of Jacob, which were the Israelites. Look at what it says here, verses 3 through 5. It says, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste to his, uh, I've laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins. The Lord of hosts says they may build, but I will tear down and they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this and you shall say great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. You see, very simply, what, what this is referring to is that due to their wickedness, God was saying, look, I have, I have brought punishment and I will bring punishment on, on the descendants of Esau, the Edomites. But even though Israel, the descendants of Jacob, even though you guys have failed, even though you've strayed, God is saying, I've established my covenant with you. It's not, doesn't mean he's not going to bring correction. Doesn't mean he, mean he doesn't bring discipline. He's just saying, I love you. I'm not only declaring it, I'm reminding of you, I'm reminding you of it, and I'm proving it to you. Uh, the Edomites, they will be punished for their wickedness. The Israelites, you may be disciplined, but I will always love you. You see, dear church, this whole thing that we've been reflecting on here today is really no different for you and I who belong to the Lord in Christ Jesus. You see, God has loved us 
Those who belong to him in, through faith in, in the person and work of Jesus Christ, God has loved us before the foundation of the world. He's lavished us, us in his grace. Now, again, b- before you, I'm going to kind of take a cue from Malachi here. Before you get angry at me and get frustrated and say, wait a second, what's all this before the foundation of the world stuff? You're saying God chose? What's the deal here? Before you go there, I want you to know that that is the word of the Lord. That's from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Go read it after the text. It's what it says. God chose us before the foundation of the world. He's lavished us in his grace. He's not only declared his love, but he's proven his love to us over and over and over again, even though we have failed, even though we stray, even though we stumble, even though we rebel, he has been faithful to love us. He loves us, church, by not abandoning us I mean, God is not the God who who the minute we trip up, the minute we make a mistake, he says, all right, I'm done. I'm on to someone else. That's not our God, but he's faithful to us. And he promises to sanctify us, to conform us to the image of the son. He loves us by not leaving us, nor forsaking us, but promising to be with us always. He loves us by providing for our every need. A sermon for another day would be that needs are different than wants, but you just need to know he provides for our needs. Church, if you're like me, if you're like me, I think you tend to forget God's love for you. I mean, something that can very easily happen when there's the slightest bump in the road, things aren't going the way that maybe we think that they should go. We get frustrated with life and our circumstances. We begin to assume that God is forgotten. And we cry out like David, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? And then we just stop right there. We assume that we've lost out on the love of God. I remember a particular time where uh, Sarah and I, this was a few years back, we were uh, just going through some difficult circumstances, not not in our marriage, but really just with ministry and life and things were just really, really hard. And I remember both Sarah and I were feeling like we were forgotten by God. I mean, this is what was, uh, these were the thoughts that were coming to our minds, that God had left us, that God wasn't at work. And I remember we were on a a, a drive and we just took some time. I think the kids were sleeping in the back and, and we were talking and we decided to take some time to intentionally remember all the ways that God had been faithful to us, all the ways that God had been at work, all the ways that God had demonstrated his love. And so we just remembered, we just, Sarah got out a piece of paper while she was the passenger seat, of course, I'm driving, and, and she just starts writing down God's faithfulness, God's provision, God's guidance, God's power, and she was specific. This is how God has been at work. We remember that even though things at the time were hard, that our feelings lie to us. Like our feelings aren't always telling us the truth. Not that feelings aren't bad. God created them. Jesus had feelings, but we need to be cautious with our feelings. Sometimes they lie to us. And so we were remembering God has not forgotten us. God loves us. We were remembering that even though things were hard, God was present. And by the end of our drive, both Sarah and I had been stirred up by way of reminder. We were no longer in the dumps. We were encouraged Because we were reminded that God loved us, that God was faithful, that God was at work. It was clear. You see, dear church, maybe today you need to take some time and you need to remember God's love for you. You need to be intentional about this. Maybe sit down once the sermon uh, sermon ends with a pen and a paper. Just sit down and list all of the ways that God has shown to you and demonstrated to you his love and his faithfulness and his provision And as you write that list at the very, very, very top, the first thing that you should write down, if you are one who belongs to God through faith in Christ, is you should write down the verse, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Write it down. Let that be the first thing on your list. How has God shown his love to me? How has God demonstrated it? Well, Romans chapter 5, verse 8 answers the question. But God shows or demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, out of all the ways that God shows his love to us, and there's a lot that we could list off, the greatest way, the the greatest way, the most magnificent way he demonstrates, I love you, I've always loved you, 
is through his son, Jesus. God has loved us by becoming human flesh, living a life of perfection, and dying in our place, bearing our guilt, bearing our shame on his shoulders, suffering in our place, becoming our perfect substitute, that we might be the righteousness of God, forgiven of our sin, and promised eternal life. And all of this wasn't done because you and I started to figure things out. We started to live a little bit better and we pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps and got up in heaven and looked and said, you know what, they're doing pretty good. I think I'll give them a hand. That's not what happened. No, God God was, uh, was rescuing us even while we were still sinners. God was working to demonstrate his love to us while we were filthy, while we were dead, while we, while we were deserving of nothing but divine wrath. Wrath. God demonstrated his love to us by doing what we could not. And, and I know that we're familiar with it, but it reminds me of the story of Lazarus. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He'd been dead four days in the tomb, buried, wrapped up. Right? Never to be seen again. At least that's what people thought. That is until Jesus came and he said, Lazarus, come forth. That's what God has done for us. You and I are Lazarus in the tomb. We're dead. We have no hope. There's no way life is coming back. That is until Jesus says, come forth. May life go into you. I've forgiven you of your sin. God demonstrated his love to us. By doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. He saved us while we were lifeless. He rescued us and we could do nothing for ourselves. He reconciled us to the Father. He redeemed us and gave us new life. So dear church, I want to encourage you today to hear and know and believe the incredible love of God. You see, maybe like, maybe like the people of Malachi's day, you've, you've strayed a bit. You strayed from the Lord, you've walked in rebellion, you're living in sin. Maybe some of you listening today even have kind of some secret sin that you're hanging on to. And things that you've been doing or engaging in for a really long time and no one even knows about it except you and God. And so you've been walking this road, straying from the Lord. Well, the first thing that you need to know today, if you belong to the Lord through faith in Christ, you need to know that God loves you. God loves you and he's always loved you. And because he loves you, correction is coming. Now I know that scares us, just like it scared my little boy when he was gonna get that sliver pulled out. That scares us. Correction is coming. I don't know if I want that. I think I might wanna run away and hide. No, but you need to know that God relentlessly loves you and he loves you so much that he's going to correct you. But before correction comes, God is sitting you down right now. He's sitting all of us down because in some way, as we work through the book of Malachi, all of us are going to be corrected. Uh, every one of us are going to have things where we go, ah, maybe I, I've strayed a little bit or I've forgotten that or I've rebelled or whatever the case may be. Before this correction comes, what God is doing for us today is he is like a loving father. He's sitting us down. He's looking us in the eye. And he's saying, I love you. I love you. I've always loved you. And I want you to know that. I want you to remember that. It doesn't mean that correction is not coming. It doesn't mean that discipline isn't coming. Hebrews chapter 12 reminds us God disciplines the one he loves. You're not a son. You're not a daughter. If he doesn't discipline you, he corrects us. He disciplines us because he loves us. He certainly said to, to us, come as you are. I mean, we came to him filthy, you know, wrapped in, in, in the rags of death. And he said, come as you are. You don't need to clean yourself up first. You just come as you are. But God loves us too much to let us stay that way. He doesn't say, come as you are, now live as you want. He says, come as you are and let me transform you. Let me change you. And as I transform you and as I change you, there's going to be correction. And it's going to be like that sliver getting pulled out. It might hurt and there might be some tears and, and, and there's and there going to be things that are uncomfortable for you, but it's going to be good because I'm conforming you into the image of the son. You see, dear church, God corrects us because he loves us. So may we know today, may we know today and be assured that in Christ, God loves us with an everlasting and divine love. Let us not forget this because, again, I know the lies of the enemy. He loves to whisper. He loves to sow the seeds of doubt into your heart, into your mind, so that you think that God doesn't love you. No, if you're in Christ today, you need to know he loves you. 
I'm reminded of, I'm reminded of the, the, the hymn that, that many of us know well, the love of God. The love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Let us remember the relentless and overwhelming and wonderful and amazing love of God. And let us know that he corrects us because he loves us. Will you bow with me in a word of prayer here today? Father, we thank you so much for, uh, for these verses that we've reflected on here in the book of Malachi. And God, I, I pray for all of those who are listening today that you would, in just a supernatural way, remind us and reassure us of your love. Remind us that you never leave us nor forsake us. Remind us of the cross of Jesus Christ where you demonstrated your love for your sheep. God, remind us of these truths. Cement these truths into our hearts and our minds. Let us not doubt your love, but be assured of your love. Father, we thank you so much that you're a good heavenly father who brings correction, who brings discipline into our lives. I thank you that you love us so much that you don't abandon us, but you're committed to us. It's like a faithful husband. You're not going to leave us. You're not going to abandon us. You're going to keep transforming us. You're going to keep changing us. So God, we thank you for that. And when that correction comes, when that discipline comes our way, may we not listen to the lies of the evil one, which want us to doubt your love, but may we be reassured of your love. You're correcting us. You're disciplining us because you love us. So may that bring encouragement to us. God, I pray for, again, all of us who are listening today. May we be reminded today of your love for us in Christ Jesus. And we pray that as this sermon goes forth, that you would use it for your glory. We love you, and we pray this in your most glorious name. Amen. I want to thank you so much for listening to today's sermon. Take time to pray. Take time to reflect on the message. And don't neglect to sing to the Lord. May you be blessed in Jesus.